Hello everybody and welcome back to our study on the 17 apocalyptic prophecies. Today we are on prophecy number eight, the six trumpets. Now there are actually seven trumpets, but just like the seven seals, there were six as a part of one prophecy and then the seventh was a part of a different one. Same thing kind of happens here with the, with the seven trumpets. So we're talking about the six trumpets today and we're actually going to be moving right through this uh, fairly quickly. So buckle your seatbelts. As we get into uh, this prophecy, I want us to kind of recognize here that the, the, the trumpets are affiliated with the coming of Jesus. So they're, they're judgments that are going out to the earth to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. Keep that in mind. And a lot of people say, they say, well, about the day or the hour of the second coming, no one knows. So like, why are we even studying this stuff? Well, later on, uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, he says, about these times and dates, we do not need to write to you. Why? Because you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. People say, aha, see, it's just going to happen and we're never going to know about it. But he says later on, he says, but you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. In fact, later on, he says, do not treat the prophecies with contempt. So Jesus said a lot about the coming of these events. He said there's a time coming. It's going to be a time of great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world and never to be equaled again. And now as we're getting into the seals and the trumpets and some of these things, we're going to see a lot about this time that is coming. But something has to happen before this, this coming of Christ can, can occur. And we started touching on this in the last prophecy when we were talking about the gospel. So Jesus said in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. So we talked a little bit about what that gospel was and we're going to expound upon it more in one of the future prophecies. But essentially for now in Revelation 14, it says this angel comes and he has the eternal gospel to proclaim to all who live on the earth, every nation, every tribe, every language, every people. This is an unadulterated, uncorrupted, undiluted gospel that Jesus returns to for the people of the earth through the message of the 144,000, which we talked about in Prophecy 7, okay? So he says, what is this gospel? Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So this hour of judgment has come and these trumpets are the, are the uh, embodiment of God's judgment against the sins of the earth, which, is, which are meant to wake us up to, from, from all of the many distractions that we have to recognize that his coming is near. There's so many distractions. We got social media, we got news news and more news. We have entertainment like YouTube, Netflix, Hulu. We have Hollywood. We have shopping, so much shopping, especially on Amazon. God bless Amazon. We have sports. We got Fortnite. Everybody's busy with their, their Fortnite grooves and distractions all over the place. The attention spans today, actually, there was a study done um, in 2000, and it showed an average internet attention span of 12 seconds. A more recent study was done by Microsoft in 2015, which showed an average attention span online of eight seconds. That's less than a goldfish. That's pretty rough, pretty rough. I know for me, man, I'm online, I'm click, click, click. I remember the days, and you may not think that I'm old enough to remember this, maybe, I don't know, but when there weren't cell phones, everybody didn't just have a cell phone. And so when you were at a hotel, you had to call the front desk to give you a wake-up call when you were traveling so that in the morning, unless you carried your alarm clock with you, some of you, maybe you did that, but the front desk would call you, wake you up in the morning so you didn't miss your flight, right? Well, God is about to bring this world a wake-up call. That's what the seven trumpets are about, and especially these first six. So let's look at some scripture about these trumpets. From Joel chapter two, the Bible says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a wake up call coming to God's people. And um, it's interesting when we actually dive into this, you remember this verse, the last one from prophecy seven, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And then in the very next verse, I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. So a lot of people get this idea that the seven trumpets come after the seventh seal. And you can kind of understand why this happens for people, but we got to remember that there's a break here. 
there's a break in, in this thought. There's a break in what John is seeing, right? So sometimes he says, I saw this and I saw that and then I saw that. And all of these events aren't in chronological order. They're, they're separate visions and I saw. So he sees something separately and we have to see based on scripture, based on the Bible, based on the chronology of what the Bible says about the end times, when is this event actually taking place? So the, it's sad, kind of the chapter break probably should have been here when they put in the chapters and verses rather than where it is, uh, would have been better for the cohesive thought. But anyways, we're blessed by those chapters and verses nonetheless, wherever they are, because we can help, to fi- help us to find things. So let's pick up this, Revelation chapter 8, verse 2 on the six trumpets. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. You'll see a lot of temple language here. If you haven't watched that video, God has a courtroom in the foundation series. Be sure to check it out. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar, and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the golden altar before the throne. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth, and thunder crashed and lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. So the way that we know that these trumpets are about to begin is a global earthquake that comes upon the world. Remember the heaven-earth linkage law. When something is happening in heaven's temple, something significant, something's happening on the heavenly realm, Jesus gives us a corresponding event here on earth so that we might know what he's up to. That's why the book of Amos chapter 3 says God does nothing without first revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. And this is the start of the great tribulation when that censer is cast down Um, from heaven's altar and and the fourth seal is broken on the book of life and this great earthquake takes place. These are all synonymous events that are happening at the same time, signaling the start of the great tribulation and the last 1,335 days of earth's history. Praise God. So we get into those first four trumpets and these are burning hail, an asteroid that falls upon the sea, an asteroid that falls upon the land, and then volcanic eruptions and ash around the ring of fire, which is going to blot out a lot of the sunlight on the earth and affect the earth's food supply and and many different things. So let's start looking at these one by one. The reason that I tell you this, obviously this is kind of the bird's eye view. We can't dig into every one of these trumpets in the short amount of time that we have for this series, but I want to give you something to dig into and look at. And I want you to remember as we go through this, the rule of language. Apocalyptic prophecy can either be literal, analogous, or symbolic. And if it's symbolic, God always gives a scripture, a passage, to clearly define what his symbols are. And in the context of these trumpets, there's not symbolic language that's used. So we're either looking at literal or analogous language, and most of this is going to be literal. So here we go. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. Remember, John is looking at, he, he's seeing these events take place, and he, he's writing down what he's seeing. So when he sees fire and, and hail, burning fire coming down upon the earth, it's very likely that what he's seeing is, a na- is this natural event, but with supernatural power, uh, a meteoric kind of fire hailstorm. And it's interesting, he says, fire mixed with blood. Hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. And you say, wow, why is it mixed with blood? What does that mean? This is temple language. He says later, I will give power to my two witnesses, which we're going to look at in the next prophecy, prophecy nine, and they will be clothed in burlap and will prophesy during those 1260 days. The great tribulation shows us that there are 1260 days of judgments that are given upon the earth, time that's given with mercy meaning there's an opportunity to repent and to come to the Lord. After these 1260 days, everyone has made their decision with either the mark of the beast or the seal of God, like we talked about in Prophecy 7. And and then those last 75 days, there are judgments that are given without mercy. That's why the seventh trumpet is separated from the first six, because it is a judgment that is given upon the wicked without mercy, while the first six are judgments given upon the entire earth for the purpose of bringing people to repentance. So just keep that in mind. That's why the Bible says there's hail and fire mixed with blood coming down upon the earth. Then the second angel blew his trumpet and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. 
Again, picture John receiving this vision and he sees just this massive asteroid or mountain or giant, you know, pack of earth falling from the sky and falling into the sea. That's what he's describing. And imagine the cataclysmic, catastrophic effects of such a massive asteroid falling on the earth. It's going to destroy many, many coastal cities, throw the balance of the earth off kilter. And the Bible says one third of the water in the sea became blood. And you're like, okay, well, that sounds kind of like abnormal, like not really a natural occurrence. Maybe you've seen red tide before. And so what red tide really is, is there's these little like dinoflagellates that come up to the surface of the water um, when there's a lack of oxygen and and they kind of just consume everything that's left and they have this red hue to them and that's what red tide is so if you have this asteroid that's coming down upon upon the oceans and it's just blazing hot massive asteroid it's literally going to just boil oxygen out of the water and what's going to take its place is red tide it's a very kind of natural thing that happens we can see it um, scattered around the earth Then the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from the sky. So we have burning hail, an asteroid that falls upon the sea. Now another asteroid burning like a torch. It falls upon one third of the rivers and springs of water. All of these things are are on the land of the earth. The star's name is bitterness uh, or wormwood, maybe your Bible says. It made one third of the water bitter and many people died from drinking the bitter water. Imagine an asteroid falling upon the earth and all of the, the sewage lines and septic systems that we have in place, everything just begin to, to leach open as they're broken open because of the tremors that are caused by this asteroid. They, they leach, they, they seep into the aquifers and, and everything, the, the rivers, the streams, and people don't realize this and they're drinking that contaminated water or just because of a lack of resources at this time, they're drinking this contaminated water and getting sick. There's actually over 40 different diseases is that you can contract, which will ultimately be lethal uh, from drinking contaminated water. So this is going to be a huge, huge deal at this time. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one-third of the sun was struck, and one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars, and they became dark. And one-third of the day was dark, and one-third of the night, so a third of everything is dark. And you say, okay, again, what is, what is this about? Okay, just think literally with John seeing this, all of these events that are taking place, these asteroids that are hitting the tectonic plates of the earth are going to rupture what we know as the ring of fire. This, this ring of, of volcanic activity that is around these continental shelves and continental plates um, surrounding the Pacific Ocean is already relatively volatile right now. So imagine with these asteroids ripping into to the continental plates and the oceanic plates of the Earth. Wow, it, this is going to just spew lava and magma up into the air and the ash that comes with that. Uh, scientists, you, it's interesting, you can watch TV shows and stuff about like the apocalypse and different things today, natural disasters, and see how fragile our, our, our world really is. This ash would be carried around the, the jet stream, around the middle third of the earth, which is where most of uh, the plants grow, most of our crops grow. So this is going to cause, first of all, tons of respiratory issues. It's also going to cause uh, major food shortages and famine to happen. Uh, plants won't be able to receive sunlight anymore. I mean, this is going to be a huge, huge deal. And God knows that. God knows that. So with these four trumpets, we kind of ask the question, and, and I remember when I first kind of came into this understanding and began to look at Scripture for what it says and stop imposing my own private interpretation upon Scripture, I began to ask this question, how can God be good if he's allowing all of these things? This is a question that plagues a lot of Christians today. It's a question that a lot of atheists will ask, you know, Christian, how can, how can a child be... Uh, you know, given a diagnosis of, of terminal cancer, how can somebody die in a car accident? How can a person that seems really good person have such a, a plagued life? And then a person who seems like really nasty or wicked seem to have such a charmed life. Like, how can God be good? And in reality, it is God's goodness that is bringing this to the earth. Because he realizes how distracted we are, how caught up we are with the things of this world. And he wants us to have eternal focus, eternal perspective, to bring every possible person into the kingdom of God during this last phase of earth's history. And the Bible even says, when a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes, 
Has not the Lord caused it? And so the people say to God, the Lord isn't doing what is right. Because our version of goodness means comfort and luxury and, you know, no pain. When in reality, what goodness is, is having someone's best interest at heart. And so God says, repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. That's what these trumpets are about. These judgments coming upon the earth to reveal that there is a God in heaven that is in charge of everything that's going on here, and we need to submit to his authority. He says, I don't want you to die, says the sovereign Lord. Turn back and live. So those first four trumpets during that time, and we're going to talk about this in one of the future prophecies, there's going to be a government that is established on the earth in response to these supernatural events that's going to say, wow, we got to get right with God in order to, to stop these things from happening or the entire earth is going to be destroyed. Because the Bible says 25% of the earth's population dies in these first four trumpets. So we'll get to that. That government's called Babylon. It is the, the beast with seven heads. For now, we, mo- we keep moving And this is kind of intense because after those first four horrific events, now the Bible says, not before, but now, woe, woe, woe three times to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts that have just come? No, because of the remaining three. So these first four are going to be nothing in comparison to the last three that are coming. And these are, these are, they're, they're intimately linked these last three trumpets. And I've never kind of thought about this before and I started putting this study together and I realized the 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 intimacy of these last three trumpets. Number one, and and I'm going to kind of tell you what these are now and we're going to look at the scripture. Number one, uh, trumpet five, Satan appears and begins to establish his own dominion, his own reign here on the earth. Uh, You can look back at prophecy three to look at who the Antichrist is and how that kind of plays out and how that's going to work together with this one. Trumpet six, um, Satan's theocracy, this government that he sets up, which is focused on a, like a spiritual leader, which he will claim to be himself, is going to massacre all of his opposition. And it's really interesting how God allows Satan to do this for a lot of different reasons, many of which I'm, I'm not g- going to be aware of until later on when God reveals it to us, but some of which are apparent from Scripture. Number one, to, to bring people, to force them to make a decision one way or another. Number two, to reveal the kind of government that sin in its ultimate form would establish and the contrast between that and God's government based on the laws of love. Because just like in seal number four, where God releases these first four trumpets and he allows those four angels that have the four trumpets to kill 25% of mankind, God allows Lucifer to release these four demons upon the earth to kill the exact same number of people in the sixth trumpet. So he gives Lucifer the rope in the rain to do exactly what he did because he's establishing this picture, this story, this timeline for us. And then trumpet seven, this is the one that will not affect the righteous. We're actually not talking about it in the scope of this particular prophecy, but we will in the future, um, is where God is going to avenge the wrongdoing of Satan the demons in the wicked people of this earth, all the atrocities that they've carried out against other people, against the people of God. He is going to uh, make that right. There's going to be a recompense for that at the end of the tribulation. So that's trumpet seven, but we will get to that. So let's jump into these last uh, two trumpets here. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. We talked about in previous prophecies what this abyss actually is, this unseen realm. Jesus referenced it many times. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it and like the smoke from a gigantic furnace, the sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss and out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So get this, this is basically uh, two thirds of the way through the tribulation from what we see in scripture. And we'll expound upon that again as we continue through these prophecies. But at this point, Satan and his uh, minions are allowed to harm people who have not yet made a decision because that is what God is doing. He's forcing every person to make a decision. So by the time he's, he's carrying out his death decree, like we talked about in previous prophecies, um, 
almost every person's decision has been made. And, and God is just going after that last one, how he leaves the 99 to find the one. He's going to allow this, this martyrdom of his people that we're going to look at in Trumpet 6 to occur because of that, that reason. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. They're going to force them to make a decision. One way or another, seal of God or not, you are going to make a decision. Very important facet of this story. They had over them the king of the abyss, the angel king of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek is Apollyon, which means the destroyer. Yeah, so I don't know. This isn't like super difficult to discern <laughs> the king of the angels. Uh, there's many names that the Bible uses for him in prophecy. Satan, Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, the lamb-like beast, the angel king, the destroyer, the stern-faced king, the horn power, man of lawlessness, antichrist. There's many names for Satan just like there are many names for Jesus. And he is the king. He, he is this, this being that is going to come and establish dominion. He's the only one. The only one that God would allow to do this, the only one with the kind of power that it would take to do this. No human being, when you look at the entire story, could carry out the things that this individual is going to carry out, accomplish the things that he's going to accomplish, unless it were Lucifer, Satan himself. So the sixth angel sounded his trumpet. And now Lucifer has come in this fifth trumpet. They come up out of the earth. God gives them the, the ability to be able to be seen, to enter the, 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 our realm today, to interact with human beings. This is why the Bible says such a great, whoa, this is going to be frightening. And he's going to begin to establish his government. By the time his government is established, this is when the sixth trumpet is sounded. I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the sixth trumpet, and this is what I was talking about, very similar to the first four trumpets. Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels, or demons actually here, who had been kept ready for this very day, this very hour, this very month, this very year, were released to kill a third of mankind. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur which came from their mouths. So, so God is allowing this, this death decree to go out. And the reason I say that, we don't see everything from this particular prophecy. Remember, this is about repetition and enlargement. You have to look at how this sequence of events lines up with the other things that we've been looking at and with what we're gonna continue to look at as we're about halfway through these prophecies. And what we see is this death decree that Lucifer gives out that is actually carried out by human beings who are following him, who have taken the mark of the beast. And they go out to the earth to find all of God's people, everyone who would speak against the name of Satan and to kill them because they believe that God is now here. Satan is God and he is now here on the earth and their loyalty is to him. So the comparison between this and the first four trumpets is really interesting and I wanted to just make a little illustration for us here so we can see. Let's just consider this, the earth's population and let's just divide it into fours, right? So in trumpets one through four, the Bible says that God allows these angels to kill a fourth of mankind, right? Does that make sense? So then over here in six, when these four demons are released, and the Bible says that they're released to kill a third of the earth, what is left of the earth, if you have already, it's nice and easy for us, we have th thirds already because of we've lost a fourth. He allows Satan and his angels to kill a third of the remainder which is the exact same part that, that God has just eliminated from the earth. So really interesting how God gives Satan his, his, full, his full reign, his, his full rope. He wants him to establish his government to do what he's going to do, whatever he wants to do. And, and obviously this is all part of God's plan. It doesn't catch God by surprise. But he's using that for a couple reasons. Number one, remember this, to carterize the decisions of the people of the earth so he can separate the earth into sheep and goats. And number two, to reveal to everyone for all of history what the ultimate form of sin and the ultimate government of a sinner would look like. All right, so we're wrapping it up here. Prophecy number eight. I put this chart up here so we can see these. Um, this is available for you online if you want to download it uh, in the chart there on the side. And... Um, we see 
The seven angels are given their seven trumpets. They're told to wait. We're in this period today where we're waiting for the censer to be cast down, the global earthquake, the fourth seal to be broken, and these first four trumpets to come. They happen in rapid succession. Satan's government begins to be set up, but he does not appear here until the fifth trumpet. And then five months later, he is allowed to make his death decree against uh, the people of the earth. And then there's a period of time before the seven trumpet, which is actually the seven bulls. And we'll look at that um, as we continue through these prophecies before Jesus finally appears, praise God, and rescues us from this nightmare. So let's look at the four rules as we continue through here. Number one, the rule of sequence. Every apocalyptic prophecy has a beginning point and an ending point of time, and all of the events must occur in the order that they're given. The sequence of this prophecy, you have the seven angels that are given the trumpets. Number two, you have an angel at the altar of incense, and he has the prayers of the people of God, which he then pours out upon the earth when he casts down that censer, which starts the great tribulation. Uh, the Lord answers the prayers of God's people who are, who are crying out peace and safety. The censer is cast down. And then number four, um, the angels prepare to sound their trumpets. Then the trumpets sound, one through seven, in order. In this particular prophecy, there's six, but ultimately, like I said, there's seven. Let's look at rule number two, the rule of fulfillment. Um, essentially, a prophecy cannot be fulfilled until all of the specifications are met, including the sequence, the order that was given. So according to Prophecy 7, the angels have been given their trumpets in 1994 at the end of that Jubilee calendar. We've been looking at that in association with Rule 4, the rule of time, how the, that time ended the Jubilee calendar from 1437 B.C. to 1994 A.D. These angels are given their trumpets and they're just awaiting what we saw in the last prophecy, Prophecy 7, the sealing of the 144,000 before the censer is cast down and they begin to sound their trumpets. That wait period is so interesting why God includes that. Why didn't he just do it? He's revealing to his people in this waiting time, the last generation, what is coming. The rule of language is super important in this prophecy because a lot of people like to just make up stuff with these trumpets and it says there's you know, fire mixed with blood and it's coming down and then uh, something falls, a mountain of fire falls upon the earth and they just want to make stuff up. That's called a private interpretation. And th you can't come to that conclusion unless you're you because only your mind works the way it does. The rule of language protects us from private interpretations. It keeps us in line with what the Bible says. So we can't just make up symbols, and there are no symbols given in this prophecy. So we know that it's literal or analogous. We see the analogous language when we see like the, the mixed with blood being the temple language for mixed with mercy. We see um, other, other examples of analogous language, but mostly we see literal language using these prophecies. The angels actually will come out of the abyss. And God uses literal language. I, I really want us to get this. God uses literal language to describe spiritual things. You see what I'm saying? Like, like the, you may not actually have like, like a gate opening up out of the earth, but he's literally describing in the unseen realm with literal language, what is actually happening. It's not symbolic, it's really happening, even if we don't quite see it the exact same way. So this is very literal language used through these prophecies, and no one has the authority to just declare that it means whatever they want it to mean. Only God has that, and since he doesn't give symbols, we know that that doesn't exist. Rule number four is actually also used in this prophecy when it talks about the five months um, and different periods of time. So since those times are in the great tribulation after the end of the jubilee cycle we know that it's a day for a day and not a day for a year which is awesome because i don't know how any of us would last <laughs> through 1335 years of great tribulation help me so those are the four rules that's how they apply to this prophecy we'll continue looking at the unfolding of these events this has been prophecy number eight the six trumpets from revelation chapter 8 verse 2 through chapter 9 verse 21 join us next time as we continue our series on the 17 apocalyptic prophecies looking at prophecy number nine on the two witnesses it's going to be exciting we'll see you then